Um, hey everyone, yeah, this is D5 Technologies. They are dual listed. Um, one is on the NEO in Canada as DEFI, and then the US um, ticker uh, over the counter is DEF um, TF. Um, they actually just earlier today reported that um, in US dollars, their AUM is about 440 million um, as of uh, pretty recently. And then that compares to a market cap of just 138 million. So um, certainly the overall crypto bull market is, is benefiting them. And yeah, I'd love to um, hear more about um, the pitch and um, kind of some of the more recent events. Thanks a lot, Ed. Um, I'm assuming I'm good to go here, guys. Yep, take it away. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, name is Russell Starr. Um, a lot of you know me already. Uh, I, I, I tend to uh, present in a very casual fashion. Um, so please fire your questions out uh, as uh, as you see fit. And and the team at Singular, whom I want to thank for, for this opportunity, will we'll read them out. Um, as many of you know, um, we are primarily an ETP company, an ETF company, if you want to call it that. Um, slight different tweaks in Europe to the structure. Um, we still own our 6.6 .6 stake of Amina, which uh, used to be SIBA. Um, I find it ironic that, that there's absolutely no valuation um, associated with that position um, in our stock price currently. Um, and if everyone recalls, we put about uh, 30 million US into this, into this uh, crypto bank. Um, Maybe two two and a half years ago, um, and it's it's pretty clear right now that 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 position is is likely up substantially. It's a private company, so it's hard to tell. Um, but just based on a, on what Bitcoin's doing, it's not it's not a far fetch to assume that. Um, obviously, our venture portfolio continues to do well, um, and then you obviously know about our infrastructure business, which is node management, um, a smaller part of our business, but in a bid market can actually be very very revenue intensive. Um, and then I think a lot of you are also aware of the fact that we recently bought Anthony Pompliano's research business, Reflexivity Research, um, and would like to welcome Anthony and Will officially to the team, not just as advisors, but actually as part of the DeFi team. And I, I, I believe a, a lot of you have also seen Anthony Pompliano um, talk about us a little bit on CNBC and, and what the amazing opportunity is with our current share price and, and the Bitcoin market as it evolves today. Um, this is the team as it stands. There's a couple of new board members, Sue Ennis uh, from HUD8, Michael and Stefan, uh, Mikael and Steph from Ariane Capital in Europe. Christian remains there. I've stepped off the board, but continue to help in all things capital markets. And Ollie, who was the founder of the company, has taken over as CEO, which was just a natural trend and, and move um, given his skill set in the crypto market and just how well reputed and well known he is. Um, Johan remains a key figure, uh, obviously the creator of XBT Provider, uh, which is now CoinShares, obviously amazing to have him on and we haven't updated this slide, but obviously Anthony is, is much more involved with the company now that we've acquired Reflexivity. Um, where we stand today, the stock came off pretty hard yesterday. We, we do uh, unfortunately um, fall at the whims of the US market makers who can and do regularly, you know, sell and buy. They're, they're trying to make their money as well. But I believe today we're sitting at 63, 64, or 65 cents up substantially. Um, our cash position uh, will likely be growing as we are now, uh, I believe, revenue positive. We're, we're in the midst of, of our audit right now. And as many people have commented, new auditor, everybody needs to be aware that the, the regulators in this industry, despite how much, um, Despite how much people want this in their lives, uh, the Canadian and U.S. regulators are nothing short of horrible. Um, they do everything they can to to make this a difficult business to exist in. A lot of you would be shocked and surprised to know that that our original auditor, RSM, won't even stand by their audit uh, because of the scrutiny of the regulators from two years ago. I mean, it's it's a valid audit. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just because of the amount of um, scrutiny and negativity that that uh, the OSC and the other regulators are imposing on this industry in North America, um, it's very, very cost prohibitive. Uh, many, many auditors are now charging one and a half, two million bucks just for a simple audit because of the level of scrutiny and, and uh, imposition that the regulators pose. And you guys have seen that in the U.S., obviously, um, just with the, everything that, that um, Grayscale had to go through just to list their product as an ETF. 
um, legitimately and literally the, the US Supreme Court had to rule in their favor to stop the SEC from, from doing what it does. Um, where are we now? Uh, I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, I believe the last time I spoke, we were at maybe 12 or 13 products. We're now at six, or sorry, it would have been 13 or 14. We're now at 16. Um, ICP has been a, a tremendous success for us. Many people um, don't understand just how compelling this is to our bottom line. As part of this deal, it's an ABS structure. We were we were lent uh, by the by the foundation about about 30 million of their tokens, which we can stake. Um, as you guys know, and and generate ICP is generating at about eight percent right now. So um, off of I, I, ICP alone, we'll probably make one to one and a half million US this year uh, alone, and in perpetuity just because of those those um, assets that the the foundation lent us. And um, you should see more of these foundational deals as time moves on. Obviously, Binance and XRP are now trading, and you would have seen today we we. Um, came out with 590 million Canadian, 440 million, well through our all-time high um, in AUM, um, and yet continue to struggle, in my opinion, in the market with our share price. Although I believe that's gonna change once we get our, our quarterly numbers out um, and everyone can see just how, how incredible the business is doing. Um, what is really interesting, and, and I'll, I'll just obviate a question here early. Um, I, a lot of people do ask me, you know, what happened when the Bitcoin ETF was launched? Did, did your Bitcoin product go down? Did you lose AUM? You know, were people migrating to, to some of these zero cost uh, funds? And I, I often have to correct them and say, well, ours is actually zero cost as well. We have no management fees. And no, indeed, we did not lose anything. In fact, we gained uh, assets and clients um, in our Bitcoin product. Um, as you well know, Solana has just rocketed for us. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a ma mathematical challenge for all of you, um, just so that you can understand how powerful this business model in, is and, and where our share price should actually be trading. Um, so Solana, we're at about 170 or 180 million. It's now our, our largest product. Um, for the sake of math, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you to, to assume that we can get it to 200 just because it's easier. Um, but you can do the math to, to take that 20 million off. At 200 million, um, Solana is yielding between five and 6% in the market. And you would have seen a press release where we brought on one of the, um, one of, one of the coders and the, and, and the trade, trading specialists from Solana just to eke out probably closer to six, maybe even six and a half percent yield. Um, and then you take our management fee of, of uh, 1.9. Um, so let's just say it's six plus, plus 1.9, um, let's call it two. You're at 8%. Um, Solana alone at 200 million in, in uh, USD AUM will generate us about $16 million US in revenues. That's just Solana. Um, and then you take off our costs, which if you include any of our debt payments are probably uh, for the year, close to 10 million. Um, just on Solana alone, we're profitable. Uh, if you assume 10, 11 um, million in costs, including debt for the entire year. If you add in everything else, um, you know, and, and you even take modest staking levels, let's just assume we only stake 50% of our assets. We actually stake um, substantially more than that now. But if it's 50% off of 440, and you do the math, um, that's 220 million in AUM we're staking. And, and again, this is just a mathematical exercise for all of you to understand how cheaply the, the stock is trading right now. Um, and again, we, we stake much more than that. So these numbers are, are biased to the downside. So, so if you take that 220 and, and, and you know, throw in an average yield of seven and a half percent, that's um, you know, 16, 17, 18 million uh, more on top of that. And, and you can see just how powerful the business model is. I, I continue to bug Ed about updating his model because um, as I do believe inherently the share price target should be much higher. Um, and as many of you know, um, sort of our, our holy grail number, which we seem to be ascending to quicker than I, even I expected, um, is about a billion uh, US. And at a billion US, this business really, really hums. Um, so you know, what are the key drivers moving forward? Um, you know, we we can launch ETPs on on anything. Obviously, we're going to focus in the crypto area. Um, you know, six months ago, we had to really contemplate maybe migrating outside of crypto just because the market was so much weaker. 
uh, now today crypto is once again flying and and from from the people that I talk to much of the the early weakness if you can call it weakness we're trading at I think 51.5 or 51.7 so so I use weakness with a tremendous grain of salt uh, that 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 selling off is due to the Genesis bankruptcy which um, I would hope will be cleaned out here in the next few days at which point I think we really do see Bitcoin move to that 60, 65, and maybe even higher um, with a lot of people projecting some, somewhere in the 100 to 150 range. Obviously that gets us to a billion, obviously launching new products, which you can see all the potential opportunities we could do. Um, we, we anticipated another 20 products this year. Um, the exchanges and the regulators in Europe are far more proactively supportive of crypto. Um, and I do see that emerging as, as an opportunity in the US. I just think it's gonna take time. I think you guys uh, will be surprised. Um, I'm not as confident that an Ethereum um, ETF gets launched. I, I'm hopefully wrong. And I, I really do think we're a long way off from seeing anything close to a Solana or any of these other uh, more DeFi based protocols being launched as ETFs in the US. So we really do have a massive competitive advantage. Um, you know, we view the world outside of the US as, as our oyster. Um, and eventually will come to the U.S., uh, but for the time being, until the regulators actually uh, recognize this is a value-add business, um, it's just not worth trying to push it. That being said, if we do get to the two, three dollar range, which I think is a much more reasonable and closer to fair value for for where we're at in our business and the growth trajectory, um, just so many people understand, you know, most companies are trading at 20, 30 times profits. Um, in, in this uh, this and other spaces that are high, high growth. Uh, we're not even close to that right now. And I, I get it, a lot of you want to see the financials, but honestly, why don't you just really look back to 2021 and Q3, uh, take a look at them. We were at, I believe, closer to 500 million in AUM Canadian, uh, so much lower in US. Um, and I think we were, we were somewhere around eight or 9 million US in revenues uh, for that quarter. So, uh, you know, all of all of the math is there for you to grasp. You just have to take a look at it. Um, and and obviously, my job is is to get institutional research. I'm working on that diligently. Institutional marketing. I, I, I can't even tell you if we have any institutions in our stock to date because of the massive sell off before um, the space just went new, no bid. And I suspect many, many of the institutions are long gone, but we have cleaned up the stock. Many, many, many insiders have been, um, uh, well, and most of all, all of the financings that we did, uh, in the last four months, I believe that two and the $1 million financing that went all to insiders, myself, Ollie, Johan. Um, so none of that you're going to see coming out at your face in the market. Um, with that, and I know this was kind of high level, it's, it's, I'm keeping it high level just because I, I appreciate that many of you are repeat customers listening to this. I really do want to open it up to questions so that we have an opportunity to really dive into the business and, and get everyone here on, um, on the call an opportunity to ask me um, anything and everything they want uh, related to what's going on with, with the company and uh, my thoughts on Bitcoin moving forward as well. Um, thanks, uh, Chris. Is there any um, uh, questions from the audience, or should I go through some of mine? Uh, Ed, please uh, go through yours first while we compile questions from the audience. Um, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks, thanks for all that um, information, and yeah, excited to see the fourth quarter results. But um, it's it's nice to see the AUM kind of in real time, really ramp pretty tremendously, and and the fact that you're already over. Uh, uh, above um, uh, last market's pieces. All time highs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess um, I just kind of want to go back to the Bitcoin ETF because, again, I'm sure that's going to be a question everyone's in the top of their mind. Um, how do you see that overall? Do you, do you view yourself as a technology provider? Like, would there be any scenario where some of your technology or some of, of your products for the ETH where you're staking? would be licensable or somehow we monetize that um, if, if an ETH US um, ETF were, were launched? I don't necessarily understand your question, Ed. Are you talking sort of about white labeling or 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 uh, integrating our product into a US ETF? Is, is that what you're asking? 
or, or more so is, is you, you've made a tremendous progress of monetizing these ETFs, the Bitcoin and ETH yep. ones, without charging fees. Um, yep. Is there any scenario where A, that structure you think could be allowed in the US, and B, where- Oh, I see what you're you saying. So, license uh, that technology or risk management or, or anything that out to, to maybe have US- as well. So, so, so look, I, I mean, a, a, a politically correct way of answering this is um, if there is an ETH, ETF um, allowed in the US, just based on what I'm seeing, reading and hearing, I, I would guess with kind of 90% or 80% certainty that they won't allow any sharing of staking. So mm -hmm. our, our product, um, especially our ETH staking product, where we share the staking yield, I, I see that as being a much more competitive and intriguing product. And I really do think that, that you're actually going to see migration of institutional assets uh, what, with BT, BTC, obviously skyrocketing. But as soon as people get a little bit more of an understanding about our products, where they're listed and the opportunities, you actually may see a migration into our product. Um, I don't see us trying to penetrate the US uh, with our products. Uh, anytime soon, just because, you know, the way I view our business is, look, it's great. We've got a BTC product. Look, it's great. We've got an ETH product. But really where people need to see this business growing, expanding, and, and ripping is in all of the altcoin um, products we're launching. Much higher yield, which is revenue for the company. Uh, and as Bitcoin becomes more and more uh, or appreciates more and more and becomes more accepted in the US, you're going to see, I think, a substantial flow of funds into these alt products as people look to try to pick and find the next winner like Solana. And if all of you remember Q3 2021, our Solana product didn't exist, I believe. And, and if it did, it was it was a tiny, tiny portion of our, uh, of our AUM. It's now our largest product. And, and who knows which is going to be our next our next, our next, our next, um, ICP, um, any of those other protocols. So that's a little bit of a long-winded way of answering, you know, no, I don't, I, I don't see the U.S. As, as being that opportunistic model, at least for the near future. My hope is that as, as, you know, companies such as us or 21 shares, there really aren't a lot of people in this, in this business doing this, despite the fact that, um, ETFs are the fastest growing component of the capital markets. Um, and then you layer in crypto as being, you know, something growing two times faster than the internet. Um, I think you're just going to see capital moving uh, theoretically offshore to us until the U.S. gets its act together. Um, Helper, I guess on that note, in terms of where your customers are today, um, yep. Are they all physically, most, or the vast majority physically present in Europe? Or do you kind of have people customers all over the place and it's just the, um, I guess the, the, the product itself is, 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 is custody in Europe. Uh, uh, cus well, our, we, we custody at Fido, um, Anchorage, like we, we use multiple custodians. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, obviously in European, they're European arms. Um, but, uh, Sorry, what's the question again? Like, I, I'm just. I, I'm, Where are I'm the actual little... customers from? Oh, I know yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, I, it's hard to know, right? Because our products are KYC'd and bought often through institutional entities, but for their retail customers, they mm -hmm. control that information. So, so it's almost like you asking me, you know, who who bought the last ten thousand shares of DeFi. Um, you know, unless they're they're a nobo, non-objecting beneficial owner, I mm -hmm. will never be able to find out who that is. That being said, again, what we did see was larger and larger purchases of our Solana product recently, like five, 10 million, sometimes in a day. Our belief is that those were institutional part purchases. Um, where they were, is very hard to ascertain because as you know these you know any substantive fund or or even smaller fund today operates almost always from a macro perspective that being you know unless they have a us centered focused only fund that they look for opportunities globally mm -hmm. um that makes sense helpful 
And, and then um, you talked about on the yield side of, you said about half of your assets right now are, I think you said either staked or, and or uh, they're all, some of them are collateralized lending. Um, have you seen lending rates also pick up? Yes. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I, wanna, I wanna be very clear. We're staking much more than 50% of our AUM. As our AUM grows, we stake a higher and higher percentage of that AUM because we can allocate a smaller and smaller percentage. It, it's hard to, unless you see it mathematically, it's, it's hard to understand. But if you're, if you're staking 90% of your assets at a billion, you have a hundred million to deal with any black swan events. At, at current levels, you know, we're probably staking closer to 80%. Um, so, so that's the math, but, but um, no, we, 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 uh, we see yields improving um, if you look at ICP, that's about 8%. If you look at Polkadot, I think it's back to 13%. Solana, like I said, is kind of that 5-6%. Um, and I expect that that to improve as the market goes more bid. Um, but it may not improve, you know, any more than a percentage point, maybe two. Um, helpful, thanks. And Chris, any, uh, any questions for the audience or should I keep, keep going? Hi, Ed. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in, um, and then I suppose you can keep going after that. Sure. How do you market yourself so more investors know DeFi is an option for ETPs? So, um, very good question. Uh, basically, all of the growth you've seen now was organically. Um, there, there, we did, um, in the last bull market, um, have a marketing and IR firm, IR PR firm called Waxman. Uh, but as the market went no bid, it just became cost prohibitive to, to have IR and PR. Now that we're cash flowing and, and like I said, very likely profitable um, and substantially so for sure for this year we will be, um, you know, we, we have the opportunity to be more aggressive on the marketing front. Um, I can tell you that I'm marketing institutionally in the next couple of weeks with two different firms. Um, I do anticipate some institutional research coming out in the, in the near future, uh, meeting with another analyst next week. And I think it's just hitting the road again. Um, and and to, to be more explicit, um, we are in the process of bringing on IR and PR in Europe to, to really push our products. Um, but it is quite exceptional to see how much we've grown just organically. Uh, you should also be aware, everyone, um, you know, Europe is great. It's one of the biggest markets in the world, but but we are actively pursuing opportunities, Middle East, Asia, to list our products, to interlist our stock. Um, it's our view uh, that we're not trading anywhere close to reasonable value. It should be closer to probably a 200, 250 million U.S. market cap. Um, and, and we will look to interlist in some of these much more um, sensible um, markets. And, and of course, that, that, look, everything I think changes when, when we get our Q4 and Q1 out and people just see the, po the power of the model. Again, um, I can point and you guys can question me and, and really in the end, you know, it's, it's quarterlies and, and financials that will, will drive, I think, the next massive run in the stock. Um, but, but, you know, the world's our oyster Every, everywhere except for the U.S. and basically Canada wants to see uh, both ETFs in these products and, and, and the underlying ecosystem grow. It's, it's really, truly just the U.S. who seems to, well, and the SEC that just continues to want to put their head in the sand and ignore the opportunities that, that would, would be um, there for, uh, you know, the U.S. market in general to really build and be a major player in this space. What are the synergies of acquiring the research firm Reflexivity? Oh, th those are huge. Um, and thanks, that's a good question. And I do get it regularly. Um, you know, the easy answer is just look at BlackRock Fidelity, any of these AUM arms, they all have their own um, research and, and marketing departments. Well, now we have our own research and marketing department. But if you actually take it a next step, um, a, you've got one of the most respected theoretical analysts in the space, and Anthony Pompliano, who's now even cl more closely aligned. Um, you know, he took stock for a reason. Everyone, he like like he could have asked for cash. He wanted stock in our company because he sees 
the massive upside of TradFi embracing uh, DeFi moving forward. It, it, it's it's you know the single biggest risk is Bitcoin going back down to sixteen thousand, which I think we can all appreciate is is highly unlikely now that we've seen all these these scandals and black swan events. Um, so that's the other synergy. Then then we have Will Clement, who's one of the most respected analysts in the space, looking at at new products, new new tokens, new protocols. Um, for example, SEI, um, you know, that's one of their favorites. We're we're in discussions with them now. I wouldn't be surprised if you see an SEI ETP. So there's there's tons of synergies both on new product development, um, venture investment opportunities. Um, you know, Pomp was the one who brought us Sovereign. Sovereign's been a huge winner for us. Um, and and then and then you just you get like I, I mean I get invited now to all of Pomp's conferences. So I'll be you know in New York in March. So it's it's um, it's got massive opportunities, massive synergies, and then if you take the next step, once people see our quarterlies, once people realize how much and how well the business is doing, the stock appreciates, we get to our you know the two three dollar level, you know we will absolutely try to uplist, and then you have you know this this marketing arm in the U.S. with a with a U.S. listed stock on a much more reputable exchange. Is Bloomberg the only place U.S. investors can gain access to DeFi's products? Uh, well, you can go to Bloomberg, pull up any of the the ISINs and and um, whatnot, and you can go to your dealer and ask them uh, to buy it. Um, they have they have ISINs. I mean, I I can go on to you know my Scotia account or my uh, my Echelon account and and ask them to buy me the products. So. Um, yeah, like it, just like a QSIP would be used for a European buying a North American stock or equity, you can do exactly the same thing because legitimately our products, our ETPs, are 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 traded, listed, and and you know trade like any other equity. It's just that they're European listed. Um, we now now one thing I should note: we are looking at creating and and settling a lot of these products in U.S. dollars, which will make it more uh, simplistic. Because as it stands now, and you can appreciate it, if you're listing products in Scandinavia and Europe, you're denominating them in the in the local currency and the euro. Uh, but we do recognize that by actually um, listing and and settling them in USD, we we will also bring in more. Uh, appeal from from retail institutional uh, potential buyers. Do you have proprietary features that would make DeFi an attractive acquisition candidate? Um, great question, um, and and I, I I am almost mad at myself that that it's being asked. Our our you know single biggest most um, important. Uh, differentiation right now is the fact that we can stake all our AUM. Just go look at what Gray Grayscale's not staking. Not, I mean, they, they make all their money off of their their management fee. We, we, and and you know, you the person who asked it kind of answered their own question. If if in the U.S., let's say, let's just say, an Ethereum ETF is is allowed. I'd I'd be very surprised if they allow any staking or or sharing of fees on that product. We can stake ours. So so our product differentiation is a our revenue model, but it's also the nimbleness and the speed at which we can actually launch any of these other ETPs. Remember, our major prospectus allows us to to basically list any of the top hundred protocols. Um, you know, you're going to see a, a levered Bitcoin products coming out shortly from us. You're going to see other um, other tokens that are up and coming being listed, you're going to see more foundational deals. Um, but but the most important part of that question is forgetting the fact that that you know we're basically an ETF company on steroids from a revenue perspective. If you look at how uh, the Blackrocks, the Fidelities, the Vanguards um, build, they buy, they don't create. Um, so, you know, if, if we can get our products launched in the Middle East, in Asia, if we can get some equity listings in, in other jurisdictions, it's not a far stretch once we're, you know, kind of that billion dollar mark to see someone come in and, and, and acquire us. Um, that's our exit strategy, to be, to be blunt. Um, and, and, you know, you really don't have to look that far to see 
what CoinShares just did with Valkyrie in the US. Um, they, they just came in six months ago and bought Valkyrie and closed the deal, I think, last quarter. What is DeFi's reputation in Europe? What is the comp competitive landscape there? There, there are some competitors you can, you can pull up. Um, there's a lot of futures products. Uh, Valor's reputation, DeFi, is, is outstanding in Europe. You can go look at, at the press um, and, and you can just look at the speed at which our products were adopted even in a down market. Like I said, we've, we've never had a down month of, of losing customers in our products. Um, it's only ever grown. That's why at a lower Bitcoin price now, we have an even higher AUM because we picked up clients left, right and center during the bear, the bear market and we're picking them up even faster now. Um, so great reputation, um, really not a lot of competition. I'd say the number one competitor is 21 shares. They're private. Um, but uh, just go look at how many products we've launched versus coin shares. Just go look at how many products we've launched versus 21 shares. Um, we are we are eclipsing our competition, and and you know I believe, and the reason why I continue to buy the stock is is that uh, you know I believe this is a five to ten dollar opportunity, and again that's a forward looking statement. That's just my own personal view, but if you do the math at two billion in AUM, which I think is possible if Bitcoin continues its ascent, um, you know this company is making a hundred hundred and 80 million, 170, 180 million in profit. Um, and, and that's just, a, you just don't see these opportunities in, in the capital markets that often. How frequently do you update your AUM? Are there metrics to value the company based on the AUM amount? Uh, well, in the last bull run, we were trading at about one times AUM. Um, Galaxy is at about 0.7 times AUM, so there's there's two reasonable comps for you um, that would would further indicate that we're undervalued. Um, we're we're in the process of updating our AUM uh, bi-monthly right now, just to make it a, a consistent trend. But once our quarterly comes out, we're also going to start providing operational updates as well as AUM updates um, because. Really, I think what's lacking right now is is people looking at, like I said, that that Q3 2021, extrapolating it to now and, and doing the math. Um, it'll obviously be much easier with the quarterlies coming out. And and I, I think at that time, you're going to see, uh, you, you know, like I said, more consistent AUM updates in a perfect world. We'll actually have it on our website at some point, just updating daily the way kind of CoinShares does. But you know we're a micro cap. We gotta we gotta put our money into building this company. Um, so in the meantime, it's it's like I said, bi monthly, and then after this quarter, um, hopefully uh, monthly or quarterly operational updates as well as consistent AUM updates. Which altcoin do you see gaining the most traction? It's well, it's Solana right now. Um, but the reason I love this company is you you can kind of benefit from whatever the next one is, as long as we have an ETP in it. Um, and, and, you know, to date, what we've kind of looked at is, is our own internal research, you know, what the market is, is showing as some of the more interesting and, and faster growing protocols. But there's a world where, you know, we will have ETPs on the top 100 protocols and you don't have to pick the winner because you get exposure to the winner just by owning DeFi alone. Obviously, it's a more diversified and, and, you know, if Solana triples, you're not going to get a, a triple necessarily in DeFi. That being said, maybe you will if it's five or ten of these products that rip. Uh, but the, I will add, I, I will just add quickly, um, we are intrigued, and, and obviously I, I mentioned SEI. That's just one of the ones that um, that, that Pomp suggested we look at. So. What has the company learned from the recent crypto winter? Uh, well, I mean, what you learn in any bear market is survival. <laughs> so I, I think by attrition, you've seen the better companies win. And, and you know, I, I never like to talk negatively about any other company because, you know, this world exists because of an entrepreneurship. That's what the capital markets are about. But, but you do see um, an attrition uh, from the last bear market. 
So I would consider us, you know, one of the winners just for surviving. Um, we've taken our costs down substantially, but again, it's it's tough when you launch a company in 2021. Um, as many people appreciate, you have a lot of capital costs to launch companies and build off of them. So, so you've seen our costs come down substantially. Um, I don't think they'll be anywhere more than six or seven U.S. tops. Um, and then, and then, you know, one of one of the big data points for us is what do we do with our Amina position? Um, uh, there are buyers out there. Um, you know, you just have to look at the Signum raise. Signum just raised at almost unicorn status. So there are buyers for this position. It's just what what do we do with it? Are we better off holding on to it? Are we better off selling it, making a handsome profit, eliminating all our debt? Um, we don't know. Uh, but in a perfect world, obviously, you'd want no debt when you go into a bar, bear market. So that's another thing we could learn. I, I still think buying SIBA was the right decision, uh, but no one could have forecasted that that sixteen thousand dollar tumble. Um, and and you know it it was it was tough, but we survived. We we as management reinvested in our company, um, and here we are today, alive and and thriving. What percent of business is from the U.S.? What is the regulatory risk from sharing staking revenue? Uh, I think I've answered that. Um, I, I don't think any of our revenues from the U.S. I, I think um, it's all coming from Europe uh, or Asia. Maybe there's the odd U.S. fund that's bought some of our products, but but just by virtue of the fact that we are launching, listing, and trading, uh, and, and the market's trading all of our products in Europe. Um, you kind of de facto go to 100% of it is U.S. Um, and I really don't see the U.S. anywhere close to allowing um, the staking of these assets. Uh, all you have to do is look at what, you know, you know um, I, I, I will call it a witch hunt because there's re like if you guys listen closely to why Gensler didn't want an ETF, you know, A, there was a futures product. So why wouldn't you allow a spot product? Like, crazy. Uh, but it was because he thought it was a big risk to the U.S. dollar. Um, and, and they will continue to try to protect the U.S. dollar, um, in my opinion, and, and try to make this industry difficult in North America. Great. Thanks for those answers. That, that was good. Uh, Ed, do you have more questions? Um, yeah, that was all for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, as as I try to do, I, I, I'm available by email, rstar2rs at valor.com. Please email me. Um, I've tried to get on the chat boards, but to be honest, um, you know, there are some some pretty aggressive people um, on the chat boards. I'd, I'd really much prefer just people to reach out to my, my email as groups. I'm happy to do Zoom calls, uh, but please reach out to me anytime. Thanks. We do have one more question that came in. Sure. Does it make sense at all to combine with the crypto miner or is that a different market? Um, good question. Uh, never say never. At, at the current moment, you know, like I view the U.S. market as kind of a bit backwards. Um, if you really think about it, the miners were viewed as proxies to Bitcoin. Now you've got an ETF. Um, and so de facto, just mathematically, logically speaking, you, you, you would think that, that you would see selling of the miners and buying of the ETF. Um, that being said, data is a big deal. Um, and, and so there is value to the mining business that way. I just, I'm not totally sure what the synergy is um, from a from a pure play, whether in, you know, again, we're 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 close with Hive just because Ollie created Hive, right? Um, but you know, what's the rationale for Hive buying us or us merging with them? Well, it would only be revenue upside for us, and and I don't see us really doing anything at our current share price because we're so undervalued in our opinion. Um, never say never. I just I'm not sure there's the synergies that 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 would make a bigger and better company um, from a business perspective. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Like I said, our exit strategy is is selling to someone. Um, I think it's more logical that it's an ETF or a, a, an asset manager globally to do it because it's easier for them 
to buy than build. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. It's a difficult one though. I, it, it, my, my gut says probably not, but never say never. Great, thanks. That that concludes our the, the questions from the audience. Um, do you have any final closing remarks? Ah, no. I just uh, I, I think I think the market's missing us as an opportunity right now. I'm going to be working my butt off to change that and uh, looking for a much more robust share price, many new products. Um, and and like I said, if you guys think Bitcoin's going to 65, 70, 80, 90, you're looking at a company that's arguably trading at one times profit right now uh, at those metrics. So. Hopefully people see this. Hopefully we see some analyst coverage. Uh, you're definitely going to see some institutional marketing here near term, um, which should help. And uh, I just thank you all for either being shareholders or listening in. Okay, thanks, Russ. And that concludes the DeFi Technologies presentation.